Right, so Parliament is a total joke. This should come as no surprise to anyone that lives in the UK, but for those across the pond, we've got a sizable American audience who aren't quite convinced that the UK is actually worse than the US. We're way, way worse. We're just a satellite state of random foreign interests at this point. And that has been shown this week by the ceasefire vote. You know, the ceasefire for a conflict in Israel that we should have absolutely nothing to do with, but we do have something to do with it because for some inexplicable reason since 1997, something happened and we've got a giant cohort of foreign terror apologists living in our capital city demanding that we take a stance on this thing. So, going to give you some context for this. This is Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party, and this is now the fifth time that he's changed his and his party's position on Israel, Palestine, and the ceasefire. And this article in The Telegraph was written on Tuesday. This is very prescient because the vote happened on a Wednesday. So, Stephen Flynn, who's the leader of the SNP in Westminster, not to be confused with Hamza Youssef, who hates white people and lives in Scotland and is a leader of the SNP in Scotland, has claimed victory and said that they've given the Labour Party a backbone because the SNP have launched what we call an opposition day. That means that a marginal party is allowed to act as if they are His Majesty's opposition. That's the Labour Party usually. So the SNP get to force a vote on the ceasefire in Gaza because they care more about Gaza than they do about Scotland for some blooming reason. I can tell you the reason. Yeah, it, I, I imagine it's just a principled stance by Hamza Youssef and certainly not ethnic and racial mm. and religious solidarity. <clears throat> sure. Uh, they said that they've forced the Labour Party's hand and the Labour Party has now put in a motion for a conditional ceasefire. So this is very different. The SNP want an unconditional ceasefire because that's definitely going to influence the conflict. The Labour Party want a conditional ceasefire. And the reason for this is they both want to appease the Muslims who will leave them in droves if they don't support ceasefire up on the behalf of the Palestinians and also fend off accusations that they're anti-Semitic, which cause them to hemorrhage votes under Jeremy Corbyn's government. Important question. Let's say this motion passed. How impactful would it be for the war? I'm sure the Palestinians are just waiting for Keir Starmer's approval. Absolutely nothing. It's, it's not going to do anything. This is just to signify to their various ethnic grievance blocks, we still care about your foreign interests. Please don't not vote for us anymore and form your own Muslim party of Britain, even though that's definitely going to happen. So it would, it would be difficult, I think, to accuse Keir Starmer of anti-Semitism because I've just remembered that his wife's Jewish and he's his, raising his kids Jewish. His kids go to synagogue, yes. Yeah. But the issue is the Labour Party have active Islamists like Nadia Witom and Zara Sultana and then weird race communists like Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn in their ranks. And so, yes, it's a completely insane party, I agree. Yeah. And this, for a bit of context, back in November, they had a similar motion and Keir Starmer mandated that they vote to abstain. 56 members of his own party and 10 of his front benchers voted against the Labour Party. And so 10 of the front benchers, including our own foe, Jess Phillips, had to resign. So He's looking to amend the Labour Party's reputation by doing a conditional ceasefire and not split the party and therefore split the Labour vote ahead of the next election. Now, the following bit of information is very important. On opposition day, the SNP proposed their ceasefire vote. The Conservative government proposed an alternative motion. The Conservative government said they want an amendment which moves towards supporting, quote, a permanent ceasefire, but they want a humanitarian pause in the meantime. Now, if you can tell me the difference, that would be brilliant. But what they're conceiving of is, we'll get Israel and Gaza to stop fighting, <clears throat> we'll get the hostages out, we'll give some aid to Gaza, and then you can go on blowing each other to smithereens, I suppose. As if the conflict will ever end because it's a centuries-old blood libel, but neither here nor there, the West likes to pretend it at least has some influence over these things and, again, panders to its various grievance groups that vote for it. Labour is set to whip its MPs to abstain on the SNP motion, meaning Starmer risks a revolt if his own amendment fails to pass the Commons. So. Lot at stake for Labour here. This was on Tuesday. Now, here's the full text of Labour's amendment. We're not going to read for all of it because it's pointless. It's basically a Christmas list for world peace. Again, as you pointed out, what they say has absolutely no bearing on whether or not Israel and Palestine will continue to fight. But they're saying, we want to stop Israeli settlement. We want to stop Israeli bombardment. We also want to stop Hamas from killing people. We also want the hostages returned. And we also want them to hold hand and sing peace and love and John Lennon's Imagine from here to the end of time. Unlikely, but again, it's to appease their own constituencies that they've imported. And how much time do they spend doing this? Because if they constantly change the motion they are putting forward, it seems that it was a bit time consuming. How much time do they spend doing it? The Commons debate on the ceasefire was six hours. Yeah. We'll see the contrast between those who attended that debate versus other more important debates 
on issues that pertain to the native British population in a side-by-side well, photo I mean, a little the, later. The whole thing is very performative, as far as I can tell, because whenever these motions get put forward, as far as I can tell, Israel just ignores them. If the West says, Israel, please do this, Israel says, that's very nice of you to suggest, but we're going to do what we're going to do anyway. And this is quite an interesting angle. And I think Morgoth raised this a little while ago. It's that this conflict shows that actually collective guilt is alive and well. For example, the West is the only one that seems to believe in not using collective guilt and treating people purely as individuals. Whereas Israel wants to use collective guilt against Palestinians, and Palestinians want to use collective guilt against Israel and the Jews. We are caught in the middle, and we are trying to hold them to sort of liberal, woolly standards when neither of them want to recognize that. And the best example of this is that South Africa has filed the injunction against Israel in the International Court of, of Human Rights, and they're saying that Israel's committing genocide. Meanwhile, Julius Malena, who sings Kill the Boa, and they are actively conducting a genocide against white farmers, is looking to be the head of South Africa in the sort of next year or so. So we're being hoisted by our own standards that no one else in the world is abiding by. So of course they're not going to listen to us. Neither side's going to care. And most of the rest of the world sees the West as a bunch, well, Western leaders as a bunch of suckers. Yeah, quite. Because we're still paying for them, even though they hate us. I'm really glad we're importing these populations. Isn't it great? So the controversy amounted because in order to save the Labour Party's reputation over this vote and to stop an internal revolt, Lindsay Hoyle, who is the speaker, and is a Labour MP, decided to table the Labour Party's amendment on the opposition day. So the SNP gets act as the opposition, but then the actual opposition who are meant to stand down at that time also get their amendment in. And if the Labour Party's amendment was voted on, it renders the SNP's null and void. So he has gone above and beyond to circumvent Parliament's constitutional processes to save the Labour Party's reputation. Because they know they're screwed if they don't appease the Islamists they've reported into the country. Under threat of force, Parliament is overthrowing its constitutional norms to appease a bunch of terrorist sympathizers. That is the actual state of politics in our country. Isn't that just fantastic? So in this, it talks about a letter that was filed by Tom Goldsmith, the clerk of the House of Commons. And he wrote a letter to Hoyle saying he believed this represented a departure from the long-established convention for dealing with such amendments on opposition days. So there is serious discontent, both from elected MPs, as we'll see soon, and all of the administrative staff of the House of Commons saying, well, you clearly just did this to save Labour's reputation under threat of our offices being firebombed by Islamists or being stabbed like Sir David Amos. Still, won't talk about it. So I'm just going to play a little bit from a timestamp here. This was Lindsay Hoyle's opening speech. And uh, he was laughed at by the other MPs. And honestly, quite rightly so, because what he's proposing is absurd. He's clearly running interference for his party. I'm just going to have to scroll back slightly. There we go. We can skip back. Reflects an outdated approach. Which restricts order, order. Or you'll be going and not be voting. <laughs> well, that's the first one to leave then. <laughs> if you want to, do it. Now then, firstly, I should tell the House, in my opinion, the operation of standing order, which governs the way amendments, opposition motions are dealt with, reflects an outdated approach, which restricts the operations which can put the House, it is my intention to ask the Procedure Committee to consider the operation. I now call Brendan Hara to move the motion. So you know how you, are, you said, how long did this last for? It was that for six hours. Oh, and then Lindsay Hoyle left rather quickly and offhanded all of his duties to the deputy speaker and then came back cap in hand looking like he was about to cry because he knew his job was on the line. Not great. I mean, he's openly saying, I want to change constitutional procedure on the fly to crowbar Labour's amendment in here because, of course, otherwise, the Labour Party are worried about their electoral viability because they know they've got a bunch of Islamists voting for them. And uh, let me just ask you this, because uh, I heard him talking also about physical safety not just electoral viability, yes. because um, not necessarily every illegal immigrant gets instantly voting rights. Am I right? Yes. So in Wales, maybe. He, so it's more an issue here of the physical safety. That was what it was uh, really momentous. 
That's the he spoke of. That's the excuse he's given. The issue with that is, yes, MPs are very unsafe. But Lindsay Hoyle was the same man that after Sir David Amos was stabbed, he acted as if he was killed by a mean tweet because he said MPs need to be nicer to each other. When Sir David Amos was stabbed, Mark Francois, who I usually quite like on Brexit, came to the House of Commons and said, this guy was basically my best friend. Now we need David's law to crack down against online hate. Ah, yes, Ali Harbi Ali, notorious Islamist, just sent a nasty email to David Amos and he dropped dead. So... Yes, MPs are being physically threatened. Mike Freer had his constituency office bombed and he was actually targeted by Ali Harbi Ali. But all of them are taking the line that it's just mean things MPs and people online say. It certainly isn't the Islamists that we've imported into the country that want to set us alight and kill us. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to tell you about our merch store because we get a lot of people asking, how can we support you beyond signing up to the website? And the merch store is the best way. So if you'd like to support us, go over to the website and check it out. Thank you very much. So excuse me if I don't have much sympathy for Sir Lindsay Hoyle, either for losing his job or for feeling threatened by the issue that he's now subjected the British public to for multiple decades, and now they're just feeling the effects. I don't want him to be harmed, but it would have been more sensible not to import people here in the first place that would harm you. Now, I want to play this little clip as well, because this just shows how childish our MPs are. Because Chris Bryant, who is notorious for misrepresenting the financial dealings of Nigel Farage to the House of Commons and facing absolutely no repercussions for this, got up, member of the Labour Party, and started castigating the government and the opposition benches, to him, the Conservative Party, for behaving childishly, as he put it, on the day that Labour overthrow the constitutional processes so he shouldn't be able to speak anyway. And so everyone just decides to storm out. So this is, this is really well behaved. This is all in our interest. I am. There are perfectly legitimate views on different sides as to the propriety of today's proceedings. However... I would just say gently to some honourable members opposite who have said that that you cannot possibly have an opposition day motion being amended by another opposition party, that some of the members who are shouting the loudest... Okay. Now, if you're feeling a lot of frustration here, I don't blame you, because most of the SNP and the Conservative Party are leaving, and they're getting this outraged over the conflict in Israel-Palestine, over a vote that won't accept, uh, affect the conflict at all. Did they do any of this for the rape of thousands of girls in Rotherham and Rochdale and the like? No? Okay, just good to know what they really care about. That's, that's great. I truly hate Parliament. And I can only imagine, as you mentioned, that these people um, castigate one another for being childish when the whole procedure of how the House of Commons works is incredibly childish. It's people yelling at one another with a big group of yes men behind them, uh, laughing along and booing and hissing. It's pathetic. And I imagine it replicates the uh, dynamics of an Eton mess hall. These people are all, mentally speaking, still children. They're still in school. They've been so insulated from the rest of the world. But sadly, I can't see, I, I was, just to, to take off, off for a moment, I don't think that the British establishment has been um, made up of respectable and intelligent people probably since at least the end of the Second World War, perhaps the middle of the First World War when all of the truly honourable ones signed up and died on the front lines in no man's land. Um, I was listening to an uh, academic agent that's been doing an interesting series on his deepest law recently where he's been going through Adam Curtis documentaries. And Adam Curtis in one of them is talking about the economic troubles from the 1960s onwards. And I had no idea about this, but when Labour were in charge during the 1960s and overseeing what would eventually turn into stagflation in the 1970s, the economists that they were working with for a short time used a literal water machine to be able to try to calculate economic decisions that they were making, where they would have, I don't know exactly how it worked, but you should look this up. It's very interesting just to see the absurdity that this country has inflicted on itself for even longer than you would expect. They, there was something where they would pour in a certain amount of water and it would cause a certain amount of float, things to float over. And if it spilled over, that was when you knew that the economy was going to have inflation. And this is how our leaders have really been dealing with the country for 
decades at this point. They might as well. There's a joke in a South Park episode where they go to the st- offices of the Family Guy writers and they find that the Family Guy writers have been cr- uh, calculating their jokes by having seals pick out balls with a, uh, with a setup and a punchline. That might as well be how our country has been run for the past 70 years. It's like the octopus predicting who's going to win the FA Cup. You'd actually yeah. get, on probability, better policies resulting from that. There used to be a criticism of some societies that they were externalizing internal problems to avoid civil war. This seems to be the exact opposite. This seems to be the internalization of external problems. And the question is, what kind of society are they actually actively pushing forward? They're actively pushing forward for a society where no one literally works. Everyone is constantly protesting about conflicts around the world. And uh, England has to do nothing but all, constantly talk about these things in Parliament and just vote for motions that are inconsequential. This is proof positive that diversity yeah. is our weakness. This is we just to... internalizing foreign problems. Well, quite. If you've ever seen Robert Putnam's research in Bowling Alone, the only thing that goes up with increased ethnic and cultural diversity is TV watching because people are at home atomized and protest marches because each different ethnic grievance group wants to use the state as a resource extraction mechanism to redistribute money and privileges to their personal clientele class. This is why Eric Kaufman and White Shift, very good interview I did with him recently, go and watch, said that if you look at every single non-homogenous nation, This is why their infrastructure projects don't go anywhere, because they have consultation periods where various tribes, religions, and ethnic groups start warring over who should get the most money out of the government. And so now we just got into a a situation where the state is buying votes in favor and trying to appease the most violent Islamists in civilization with inconsequential votes. Meanwhile, everything's really expensive. There's open knife fights in the street in Luton and London and still thousands of girls were raped for ethnic and religious reasons. We have zero accountability for that. So just infuriating, but don't worry, the SNP are on the side of the Palestinian people. Yeah, that's right. Uh, This is Stephen Flynn, and he said, quote, Scottish National Party have been championing the cause of the Palestinian people because that's who they hope to replace the native Scottish with. Just the denizens of diversity. The international Ummah will just flood into your country and become their new clientele class. Isn't that fun? The night before the vote, this is interesting. This was projected onto the clock tower of Big Ben. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. This is on to the adjacent building to the Houses of Parliament. Sorry, the attached, not the adjacent. This is just open foreign agitation being broadcast onto our national monuments. Was anyone arrested for this? No. Do we think MPs were probably intimidated by the Islamists that were doing it right outside the gates of Parliament? Yes. That's brilliant. We just know that the mob can strong arm our MPs into settling the national tone for our politics. That's good fun. So after the disastrous debate, uh, Penny Mordaunt decided to get up. She's the leader of the Speaker of the House of Commons. uh, Sorry, the leader of the Commons for the Conservative Party. And she said the government actually now has to withdraw from its own opposition motion on the opposition day because the parliamentary procedures have been jettisoned from the norm to such an extent that we can't even have the debate. So in Lindsay Hoyle saying, I'm trying to protect all the MPs from being petitioned by absolutely no one in particular, and also salvage the reputation of the Labour Party, he's ruined the entire affair. And now this has resulted in him doing a grovelling apology. I'm just going to play a little bit of this, because you can hear the wavering in his voice as he knows his job is on the line. And I've got to say, I regret how it's ended up. It was not my intention. I wanted the all. I want it all to ensure they could express their views and all sides of the House could vote. As it was, in particular, the <coughs> SNP were ultimately unable to vote on their proposition. I am, and I regret, with the deep... No- with my sadness... That it's ended up on like that in this position, that was never my intention for it to end up like this. I was absolutely, absolutely convinced that the decision was done with the right intentions. I recognise, I, I recognise the strength of feeling of members on this issue. Clear today has not shown the house at its best. I will reflect on my. 
I will reflect on my part in that of the course I recommit myself to ensuring that all members of this House are treated fairly. Again, I have to ask the question, what is the point of all of this? It is coming across so performative because all of this fuss over a parliamentary uh, debate on whether they should uh, call for a temporary halt in the aggression or some kind of ceasefire in the conflict that is going on over there. Once again, even if they did say that we're going to vote to call for a ceasefire over there, unless you have the power or resources to hoist some kind of material consequences upon Israel to force them to stop doing what they are doing, Israel will completely ignore what you are doing and what you are asking them to do. America is not going to hoist those kinds of consequences because America is perhaps the only country who could hoist those kinds of consequences upon Israel, but they give their full support to it. What can Britain do in this case? And what I see this as is performative outrage for the cameras to distract from other issues and also for the fact that what will probably happen is they will turn around as we are seeing, as you have pointed out with the freest stuff and say, well, we had all of these Islamists outside of parliament, therefore we need to strengthen censorship bills for the internet. That's what this is. For the indigenous population. Yeah, which will specifically always come back on us. It will turn into spying operations on the indigenous population of Britain. Yeah, for those listening or viewing at the moment, if you saw Hoyle's face or heard the cracks in his voice, just imagine a machete pointed at him from the other side of the camera. This is a hostage video. The MPs, and the Labour motion passed, by the way, the MPs are basically voting for their lives here because they will not admit it, but they've imported a violent Islamist contingent that occupies London every single weekend, calling for jihad, intifada, and from the river to the sea, the expunging of Israel. So they're not doing this for the conflict because it has no bearing on the conflict. They're doing it so that their houses don't get harassed, their offices don't get firebombed, and they don't get stabbed like David Amos. But they still won't talk about the cause. And Jeffrey Cox is an MP, just says this is exactly it. Two possible explanations for the Speaker's decision. First, he did it to assist his former party leader to get out of a bind. Labour MP, now Speaker. Or secondly, he did it in a misguided attempt to protect certain Labour MPs from the intimidation they would have otherwise followed, that would have otherwise followed. Oh, I wonder why that intimidation would have followed. Um, could it be, as Douglas Murray have, has shared here, Andrew Percy MP uh, just explains in this short last clip. Last week, meeting with friends and survivors and hostage families. Uh, and I actually felt safer in Israel than I do in this country at this moment in time. And I had two reflections on that visit and on what happened yesterday. First of all, nobody in this house has any business agency at all in telling the state of Israel where it is able to operate to seek to rescue hostages who are being raped by Islamic terrorists who hold them. Nobody has any business. Secondly, if we have a rerun of the debate we had yesterday, we will have exactly the same thing happen again, which is that members will not vote with their hearts because they are frightened and they are scared. Yeah, yeah. And what, what do we expect? For months I've been standing up here talking about the people on our streets demanding death to Jews, demanding jihad, demanding intifadas, as the police stand by and allow that to happen. Last yeah. night, a genocidal call for from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, was projected onto this building. That, that message says no Jew is welcome in uh, the state of Israel or in that land. This is going to continue happening because we're not dealing with it. So if we have a rerun of this, can the leader explain to me what will be any different and how will members vote with their hearts and their consciences? Because too many will not at the moment because of the threats we're receiving, threats that are telling us to leave this country in some of our cases and telling us that they want us or our families to be subjected to pain and to death. Why? Why are you getting threats? Because you brought it here. You did. So, again, shouldn't happen, but you did. And this is why, if you look at a contrast, on the left, that's a vote on the UK border. On the right, vote on the ceasefire in Israel-Palestine. They're afraid. Well, can, can I ask, um, who organised this protest outside of Parliament, and where was it that they managed to get the kind, the, 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 who was providing these projectors to project such a large message so clearly because I don't know I don't know if I could go into any sort of normal shop and buy a projector so who's who's funding that action I wouldn't be shocked if there's some kind of NGO who was organizing it who if you were to dig into the finances 
were in all likelihood receiving some kind of funding from the state itself. Yeah, from the Conservative government and also donations from the Labour Party. They are creating their own problems. And once again, the, the calculus seems to be to me that the powers that be see Islamism and the Islamic populations that have, that have brought into the, the UK as something that they can manage as politically. They can manage politically by funneling it all into the Labour Party. They see they can fence them off as part of the Labour Party as opposed to creating their own Islamic parties that will run in the UK. I don't know how correct they are with that calculus. I think they're wrong. I think they're wrong because when you get a large enough mass of an ethnic population within the country, they will start to organize for themselves outside of your designated power structures. Um, But despite that, the main threat that they get from these people is a physical one rather than at the moment a political one. So they're, they're operating off this idea that they can have fenced, wall, uh, fenced gardens, um, boarded communities, uh, boarded off communities, so they don't have to deal with those problems. But the white British population are the political threat for them. If we start to organize as a political block for our own interests, we're much more of a threat to them and their position within society than the, they perceive these Islamist groups as being, which is why this always gets turned around into domestic spying on the natives. Quite, exactly. I couldn't put it any better than that. So uh, just a quick roundup because I'm, I'm running slightly over time. So the fallout of this, I mean, I, I, exact person like this that you, that you summarize is Fraser Nelson <laughs> working at Spectator. Uh, Fraser's saying, never have so many MPs feared for their personal safety. If the democratic system is shown to buckle under pressure, they can expect more pressure. Oh, Fraser, um, do you still agree that diversity is our strength? Because this was early uh, early February, and Fraser Nelson, um, he admitted to writing this, but he didn't put his name in the byline. He wrote, uh, in London, it's closer to 60% of babies born to immigrant mothers. This has not prompted the country to come apart at the seams. Instead, we have created a multi-faith society whose cohesiveness is envied by much of mm. Europe. Ah, oh, yes, I'm sure David Amos is really feeling that enrichment. Traitor. So, so Fraser Nelson years ago said outright in an interview that if you want to contain popular feeling and populist feeling, all you need to do is say that you're hearing them spout their own rhetoric back at them, and that helps to cool off some of the hotness that we experience. It seems that he's given up even doing that, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, no, in his latest column, that's exactly what it is. It's more containment and then to do nothing. So the fallout of this is SNP leader Stephen Flynn has now called for Lindsay Hoyle to resign and have a no-confidence vote in it. Um, now, he, since Lindsay Hoyle then had to respond and was very shaky again, and this was day after, as well as... Yeah, this was also yesterday. Um, now, the no confidence vote has gone in, and there's 69 signatures from MPs. This includes people like Cates and Kruger and loads of the SNP and the like. So there's a real split on the Tory backbenchers that are migration skeptics and the SNP who really want another ceasefire vote that isn't interrupted by the Labour Party. And the majority of the 1922 Commission, which is the governing body of the Conservative Party, headed by Sir Graham Brady, you know, the one that appointed Rishi Sunak when no one voted for him, they've also said that Lindsay Hoyle now needs to go. Um, so I just want to finish quickly with the, you should expect more of this under Labour. So Starmer has since denied three times, he's doing his best Apostle Peter impression, that he pressured Lindsay Hoyle today to do anything. Ha! Very interesting. Likewise, Lindsay Hoyle said in his uh, standing up at the, uh, in Parliament, saying, I didn't meet with Sue Gray today. Now, if you don't know who Sue Gray is, for anyone down the line, uh, she was the Whitehall head that did the Partygate investigation that was immediately appointed Keir Starmer's chief of staff, and her son is running in a southeast London seat as an MP at the next election. No corruption whatsoever. And when you say, oh, we've got in all these grievance groups to govern us, do you know what Sue Gray wants to do as soon as the Labour Party get in? Citizens' assemblies of random state-appointed NGO-picked grievance groups. Oh, Soviets. Genuinely, yes. It's exactly what the Extinction Rebellion crowd wants to do for the climate stuff. They're going to appoint their own activists, sit around, agree with each other, tell you exactly what policies should be adopted, and the government are just going to write off on it and pass it through. So expect like the Muslim Council of Britain and the like to set the tone for anti-Semitism and what should be policed online. Um, the reason she wanted to do this is because in Northern Ireland, it got abortion and gay marriage passed against the will of the population. So as you can see, Parliament's agenda is now set by threats from Islamists they imported. And they're quaking in their boots and they're petrified. I might humbly suggest that you deport them all and not keep importing them and stop subjecting the British, as you have for decades, to threats and occupation by this evil foreign force that care more about a war and a foreign land 
and ethnic and religious interests than the prosperity of their own country. But maybe that just makes me far right. If you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium contents on the site, such as the Contemplation series, this episode on what makes a film good. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.